Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate your coming every time we do this. Lots of you come, and that's, that's so good. This is the uh, fourth in a series of five programs we're doing this year, uh, this academic year, uh, dealing with, um, with the issues of Palestine, Israel. This is number four. Um, my name is Tom Morgan, and I am the director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at St. Scholastica. I'm delighted to have you. The lectures and the programs that we, um, that we do here are sponsored, of course, by the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here, funded in large part by an endowment by the Allworth family who are here tonight, so thank you very much. Uh, also funded in part by the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation, and by uh, Mary C. Van Evra, uh, her endowed fund in memory of William Van Evra, a former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received from the Global Awareness Fund of the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, the Royal D. Allworth Institute at the University of Minnesota Duluth, the Dignitas Program for first-year students here at the College of St. Scholastica, the UMD Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures, Reader Weekly of Duluth, and from numerous other private sources. Thank you all very much, all these people who support this program. I'm so grateful. <laughs> Now, I'm glad you're clapping. I should have been the one who was clapping, but my hands are full. Uh, by the way, the next program, there's some flyers out in the, uh, in the uh, lobby, is uh, Tuesday, April 9th. The title is Celebrating the Culture of Palestine. This is featuring a couple of young people, siblings, <coughs> excuse me, Hussein and Amina Musa, who uh, actually li they live in the United States, but they have deep connections to Palestine, and they've just returned from a trip here. I've asked them to come and have a conversation, a public conversation uh, with, in front of all of us uh, about why Palestine is important to them. That's on April 9th. Uh, if you're interested in getting on the mailing list for future programs or, um, or getting uh, postcards, either one, there are sign-up sheets out in the lobby, so please do that um, if you're interested in hearing from us again. Write carefully, especially those email addresses. Uh, there are at least two organizations out in the lobby um, that have information that you might be interested in. One is the Twin, the, the Twin Ports chapter of the Peace Not Walls group, and there's also the, uh, the Twin Ports Veterans for Peace is also out there. So stop in and have a look at what they have to say uh, after the lecture or after the program. Uh, after the program of the, the two folks I'm going to introduce, uh, you are welcome to ask questions. I would encourage you to ask questions. Students first, of course, but come right down to these microphones and you can ask your own question to these two famous comedians. Uh, after the program, I think I have it here. Um, yes, I do. We have always, by our tradition, we have another gathering uh, next week. We call it Talk Back. And the talkback session for next week, you should all have this flyer, should have been given one. Uh, the talkback session about tonight's experience will be facilitated by Sharon Opes and Rabbi David Steinberg, and their biographies, their credentials are in this flyer. I hope you can come to that. That should be interesting. Uh, on the screens, to the right and the left, we're displaying the text of tonight's lecture through technology called real-time captioning. Although we anticipated a high-quality format, how's, how am I doing? <laughs> Although we anticipate a high-quality format, there will inevitably be errors that are inherent to the technology. A special thank you to the Edwin H. Eddy Foundation, whose generous support makes this inclusive service possible. One more thing, if you have any technology in your pocket or purse, please turn it off so we can give all our attention to what's going to happen on stage. <clears throat> Excuse me. As many of you know, 
The theme for this season's Allworth Lecture Series is Unraveling the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. And to that end, I believe that we've featured a series of thoughtful and intense presentations. And this evening's program promises to be no exception, but I suspect that you'll find tonight's approach may be a little bit different. Our two presenters, Scott Blakeman and Dean Abedala, are humorists and comedians from New York City, each with an impressive career of his own. Mr. Blakeman, a Jew, has been called by NBC the top political comedian working in New York today. And by the New York Times, an astute, funny political observer. He's an original member of Laughing Liberally, a New York-based political comedy show. Scott was featured on MSNBC's coverage of the 2016 White House Correspondents' Dinner, and he has appeared regularly as a liberal commentator on the webcast foxnews.com live. He's made dozens and dozens of television appearances, including Comedy Central's Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn, and he was a warm-up comedian for the late night show with David Letterman. Scott is a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post, and he has taught the stand-up comedy workshop at the New School for 25 years. One of his students is John Stewart. I guess he got an A, huh, John Stewart? Uh, Mr. Abaidala's comedy comes in large part from being the son of a Palestine, Palestinian Muslim father and a Sicilian-American mother an award-winning comedian who was at one time a practicing attorney. Dean has a long list of credits to his name, including being co-creator and co-producer of the acclaimed internet series, The Watch List, featuring a cast of all Middle Eastern American comedians. Dean is the host of the Dean Abedala Show on Sirius Radio. He appears regularly on MSNBC and CNN. He's made numerous other TV and radio appearances and is a regular contributor to the Daily Beast. He's performed in the Middle East as well, and he's the co-creator and co-producer of the annual New York Arab American Comedy Festival. Oh, yes. And he was profiled recently in a PBS special on Muslim American comedians. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Dean Abedala and Scott Blakeman. Thank you, everyone. I'm Dean Obidala. And I'm Scott Blakeman. And, and thank you, Tom. Tom Morgan for making this possible. And, the, and to all the supporters. The, the all worth, every, everyone who uh, is very excited. By the way, this is our first time ever having this. Uh, well, is this remarkable. This is incredible. Is. And not at all distracting for comedy, I think. that's. Um, yeah. uh, how many of you by, who don't need this are going, let's follow along on this. I think it's more. Is there a person? Is this? I, I'm so tech it's not technology. savvy. I don't really know. When but I'm performing. You're not going to hear. You won't see my words. You'll hear my inner thoughts. Will be up there. <laughs> sure. So, and if there's any spelling errors, I'll be errors. saying something. Yes. What I'm really thinking, you're going to see on the screen up there. It'll be kind of fun. Uh, sure. By the way, we have to, Tom did so much work for, for so many years for peace. First of all, with the Soviet Union, which he brought down the Soviet Union. So now he's focused. <laughs> on the Middle East conflict, yes, and we need you, Tom. You did a great job with that wall and bringing things Single-handedly. So really <laughs> and uh, that's true. We're just, uh, I mean, you know, it's a very lofty, and, and the speakers that have come before us and afterwards are certainly expert in their field, and we make no claims to that other than we have a message that I think comedy is, is or bumping into mic stands. That's actually the message. The, uh, that comedy is a great way to spread a message of tolerance, of compassion, uh, and to stand together as a Jewish American and a Muslim American. And uh, we always feel that our show is success even before it starts because just bringing people together in a room of different backgrounds. And tonight alone, we have people from all over uh, Scandinavia. And so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really incredible, uh, the Finnish diversity. Swedish people, but... Swedish people, Germans. Yes. So <laughs> but... It's great to see all different shades of white people. It's yes. great to... <laughs> Really? But, it's, uh, but this is what we do, and we, and we think that you know, the best way to start a conversation, whether it's the Middle East or anything, is, is with laughter. And as you know, too often these days, people, uh, especially on Facebook, and those of you who get involved in any of those very fruitful debates, uh, it, 
dissolve, devolves into, I think this, you're an idiot, and that's basically how it goes. So we're here to uh, talk about what's going on and talk about our commonality. And, and right. uh, uh, a lot of people, I should say, how we started the show, too. We were actually on a crosstown bus in Manhattan, and one day from the east side to the west side, by the time we got to the west side, we came up with the idea for Stand Up For Peace. And, and, and even then, it's been 15 years, we said, hopefully someday we'll perform at the College of St. Scholastica. And so <laughs> we're retiring after tonight. Our, our dream is a... Anybody originally from New York, by the way? A few. <laughs> A few, oh, all right. By very law, good. they have to be. A few, all right, that's very good. So, no, and, and it's been great. Me and Scott, and we've learned about it, a lot about our own cultures, about respective cultures. I went to a Passover Seder. How many people have been to a Passover Seder here? Now, for those who don't know, it's during, during Passover in the early nights. They have a special dinner, and sometimes someone who's not Jewish will be invited. So I got invited. And this was a great example of how we can joke around. I think it's so important we joke around. So I got to ask one of the iconic questions. I said, why is tonight different than all other nights? My friend's grandmother looks at me and goes, because there's a Muslim here. <laughs> and I think it's important we know that we can joke with each other. We're all adults. We know when people are being hateful. We know when they're being playful. So let's be, let's, let's be playful as we can with each other. It's important. I think it builds bridges. It, it celebrates our humanity when we can joke about each other when it comes from a good place. Yeah, absolutely. And then tonight actually is historic in other ways, too, because we essentially started right on time, which has never happened in all the years. As you, know, as you probably know, like uh, Jewish events always start late. Arab American comedy events start late. African American comedy events start late. We were on a show recently with Jewish, Arab, and African American comedians. Still hasn't started yet. <laughs> so we're just th thrilled to be here. We actually were here already at noon. We, we did, did a show for the show. freshmen. And then we've got a 2 a.m. show for alumni coming up. They're really getting their money's worth here. <laughs> This is the dirty show, though. Just want to. Yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> That's what Tom said. He goes, "Better make this one dirty." You guys were so clean in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm kidding. Tom's reading the words. <laughs> Look, Tom. Uh, sure. Stop reading the words, Tom. I think this is. Look up here. <laughs> this is incredible. I've never. Stop. Look at my lips, not the screen. What is going on with you, people? Right, it's right here. <laughs> Some comedy sounds better than it reads, too. I don't know, but. I think we get intersperse testimony right, so from the Mueller grand jury there. I think we there start, too. right? Yes, well, uh, so, all right, so we perform separately yeah. each, each show, and then at the end we come back together, we'll joke around, but we'll do a Q&A. And Scott's going to go first tonight. You heard all his amazing credits. He's one of the top political comics in America today. It's a pleasure to work with him, a privilege all these years. Please welcome my good friend, Scott Blakeman. Thank you, Dean. We'll see you a little bit. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of an interesting, someone should take a picture of this. It's sort of a... Water on low table, water on stool, and sort of very, basically this symbolizes our society, and so the income inequality uh, through water. But uh, anyway, and we've spared no expense for the backdrop tonight, too. Uh, just, uh, no, it's lovely. This is a beautiful uh, auditorium, and we've had such a great time uh, being here in Duluth. And we were here, uh, I'm reminded, like, I'm not reminded that we were here, but it was about 14 years ago, Temple Israel, and the rabbi is here tonight from Temple Israel, and uh, uh, Amy Bernstein was the rabbi then, and, and so it's, um, actually come to think, I perform, Dean and I do our shows together, but we do separate shows. I perform a lot at temples and Jewish community centers, which gives you some idea how well my career is going, but uh, <laughs> actually tonight for me is the story, it's the first time in months where I'm not preceding a raffle. <laughs> so I'm excited about that, but um, but, you know, we like to be, as he said, we poke fun at ourselves and, and uh, you know, and it's just uh, important, again, to use comedy to send a message. We need it now more than ever. I think comedy should be almost the opposite of hate. And, and uh, we, uh, so much going on, and people are so tense, so, well, you know, this is what we do. And, and you know, I, uh, some stereotypes are, are true, actually, though, because I, I think I start some of them. But um, uh, there's a stereotype that some Jewish people like myself were not that mechanically adept. And in my case, 100% true. Um, Dean and I did a show recently at a Jewish community center, and in the middle of the show, this is true, the sound went out, the lights went out. Simultaneously, 900 Jewish people yelled out, call somebody. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, like most Jews, uh, um, you know, it's no secret, I spent the day controlling the media. And, uh, <laughs> That's what we do. You know, we control, control the media from 9 to 3.30, and then I control the banks till 5 o'clock. You know, this is what we do. 
Um, and, uh, but we love performing at college campuses, and um, uh, recently we were at George Mason University. Anybody know George Mason in the Fairfax, Virginia? It's a very, did you go there or just? He's in Fairfax. And uh, they're, they're very different than the rest of Virginia. They're, they're like, you know. You know. Uh, but it's a wonderful school, George Mason. It's interesting, I bring it up because they named their dorms after presidents. And uh, who do you think would be the most fun president to have your dorm named after socially? Well, Bill Clinton would be the one, <laughs> probably. Just in, you know, in a social way, you know. Uh, it would be kind of fun, the Bill Clinton dorm, be, you know, 24 hour partying, no RAs. If God forbid you got caught having a party, you could use the Bill Clinton defense, you know. <laughs> well, it depends on what kind of party you're talking about. I don't recall. They actually had the George W. Bush dorm, too, which is uh, not as much fun. It just attacked other dorms for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> But we're both proud of our heritage, Dean and I, and, and the source of our pride and heritage is our families. And, uh, uh, you know, as I've gotten to know Dean over the years, like our, my mom and Dean's mom, very similar. Uh, you know, growing up, my mother would always compare me to all my other friends and tell me how great everyone else is doing. Because she, she knows, she has a list of all their names, you know, with their salary next to it. You know. <laughs> you know. She'll say, you know, I spoke to Marion the other day you know, apparently our son Bobby is doing very, 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 very well. And, and it, it never matter what I said, you know, it was always, you know, very, very well. You know, when I said, well, well, how about my cousin? He's in prison, you know, but he's a model prisoner. <laughs> and, this, and I come from a very cautious family. Whatever our religion, our background, we know these kind of families. I, I once dropped a glass on the kitchen floor in my parents' house. To this day, no one's allowed to walk barefoot on the kitchen floor, you know. <laughs> My mother constructed the orange police barrier, you know. She said, you never know, the glass can suddenly spring up from the linoleum. Generally, it's a 10-year waiting period. And mothers always had these great stories, like, well, there was a boy years ago, the glass flew up, beheaded him. Thank God now, he's fine. They reattached the head. He's at a top law school now, doing very, very well. So, and, and it's, um, you know, I, Dean and I travel together. We've noticed um, uh, many things that, um, um, just, well, various places. We performed in interesting places. We once performed uh, at a place, and actually the outside said, uh, authentic kosher style food. This was what they had. Now, for those of you who don't know, kosher style means not kosher. So what does authentic kosher style food mean? It's, like, it's so not kosher, you're not gonna believe it. Even if you have no idea what kosher is, you know this isn't kosher. It's got ham, pork with cheese drizzled with milk, extra ham served only on Yom Kippur. It's incredibly authentic. Uh, and you know, when you're traveling, you know, we always go to a lot of diners and uh, I'm amazed at diners because they have like a 35-page menu. They have everything. Um, and sometimes they break it down ethnically. And, and I've seen this in some places. It says Jewish-style food. It's actually, I mean, it's a religion. You know, what do you mean Jewish-style? They have to order very loudly. <laughs> I was like, ah, can I have the brisket? Right, yes, yes, OK. Or it's Jewish-style. You have to order with anxiety. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I said brisket. I don't know why I said it. Um, I think as a kid, my parents made me get brisket, and I really didn't like it, and so maybe I'm overcompensating now, and, if, and I don't really know what I want anymore. Maybe I should question my own thoughts, and maybe you could provide some suggestions, and I, I don't think I'm qualified to even choose anymore, and uh, uh, maybe I, I'm self-destructive in that manner by ordering brisket, and um, you know, it's Jewish style. This is what we do, so. But again, the similarities, kosher food, halal, very similar, so. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, as I say, it's you know, an interesting time, and, and uh, we uh, all need to relax a little bit, because, you know, we, uh, how many of you watch, let's say, MSNBC a lot, or, um, yeah, and, or, or Fox, whatever it is, you know, uh, uh, Fox is a little different than MSNBC, but the um, <laughs> fact they just had a poll just came out recently that 18% of Fox News is true. This is what it, 
And a lot of you probably going, how did it get that high? Um, but then I figure it out. It's, it's true when they say, you're watching Fox News. Totally accurate, I stand by it 100%. It's really... But even MSNBC, and they're smart people, I think it's truthful, but it's basically uh, not really news. It's basically, you know, a host and then three people agreeing in varying degrees, right? <laughs> like, I love Chris Matthews. I met him, he's a great guy, but you watch the show, it's like, and I think this, and one of the things, what do you think? Chris, you're exactly right. It's always exactly right. You're exactly right. I can't even agree. That's a grub. No, what you said is totally true. How about you? I agree even more than he would have said. I just, uh, at least three times as much agreement there. It's so, I was, as you were saying it, I was agreeing, so that gives me even more agreement. How about you? Chris, I'm agreeing with things you haven't even said yet. That's how much I agree. I'm anticipating, I'm agreeing with it. It's exactly right. And, you know. So, we need to read a newspaper, read the, the Duluth News Tribune, which I subscribed to the last month before getting ready to come here. And uh, I, no, I did. I have a lot of free time, and I got the, the E edition. And, well, no, it didn't take a lot of free time, but it, but it was, uh, I mean, it's nice. Believe in it, Tom. He used to work there, great, wonderful newspaper, and uh, goes by more quickly than the New York Times, which I'm glad. Cause, uh, and I love how they, they always have the weather, and they always give a little, um, I even read this, I, was, I read the Star Tribune, too. I was in. Twin Cities last month, and well, when I was in the Twin Cities, uh, you know, the weather for me was kind of cold, and, but they didn't just say cold, the, the actual, this is true, they actually, under weather it said, dreary. <laughs> that's not a weather forecast, that's a mood. <laughs> it's like Thursday, insecure, you know. <laughs> but, uh, no, but I do, it, you know, I feel, uh, very comfortable, it's wonderful, and, and uh, so I think we should need to read newspapers. I get the New York Times delivered, the actual newspaper, and I know it's, does anybody get a newspaper delivered to your house? Yeah. It's a different thing, right? You actually turn a page and go, I didn't know this, as opposed to clicking or someone curating the news for you, which I don't even know what that means. But, uh, and I was on the subway in New York with my New York Times, and a, and a college student looked over and said, is that the new iPad? It's incredible. <laughs> well, it really looks like a newspaper, it's amazing. So. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we have to try to deal with things and, and um, you know, and, uh, of course, we have, in two years, we have another presidential election, and uh, uh, it doesn't seem like it was last week, I feel like we're just kind of still going through it, but um, I, uh, you know, and a, a lot of us wish that uh, Hillary Clinton won, and I remember she was our senator in New York for quite a while, and, again, whether we're Jewish, whatever our background is, don't we love to see famous people be from our religion? And uh, Hillary Clinton once said that she was part Jewish. And, she, and I was excited, and then I found out how, she said it, was, it was her ninth cousin, once removed, step, 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 great, great grandfather, once had a brisket sandwich, actually, so. <laughs> she was reformed, you know, kind of a little bit there, but. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so it's, um, and, and before I got into comedy, by the way, I should say, you know, and before Dean and I met, I, I used to, uh, I was a copywriter, I used to write ads for Macy's in New York, I don't want to brag, but sale, $9.99, I wrote that. <laughs> so, and here I am today, uh, Tom left that out of the credits, but uh, thank God, it's, it's preserved for posterity now in the archives. I don't know where this goes, actually, but maybe you'll inform me. Um, if I ever run for something, I'm finished, you know, if I ever. Uh, but anyway, so, but some people say, you think we'll ever have a rabbi run for president, and, uh, and, and Temple Israel, is, I've met two very dynamic rabbis through. Not all rabbis are that dynamic, though. Some rabbis talk a little bit too slowly in the political arena. It's like, I believe eh, that uh, fundamentally, we, it's like, Rabbi, what? They're all gone. <laughs> they left 35 minutes ago, it was a little slow. Uh, but other religions, we had Jesse Jackson, uh, a powerful leader, uh, he ran for president. Pat Robertson, a psycho, he ran for president. <laughs> he still has a network, by the way. I guess there are no standards for, you know, insanity for that, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But, uh, so, uh, but anyway, I, um, I think that, you know, our show too is, you can't just have tolerance in certain areas. We need tolerance uh, everywhere, and I think, you know, the world may seem bleak, but I think there's a lot of 
happy signs along the way that we should be happy about. And, and like in the last few years, uh, marriage equality is sweeping the nation, and that's not going back, and that's a, a wonderful thing. And, um, and I know here at the university, there was much support for that and gay rights, and that's a wonderful thing. And uh, uh, there's still people who are opposed to having gay people serve in the military. Uh, which I don't really understand why, what they're opposed to. The, the argument is, well, it, you know, you can't have gay people in the military because it creates chaos. This is what they say. Chaos, as if what? War is this organized, civilized thing to begin with? So, you know, we're trying to have a war, and the gays showed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're trying to shoot people. That they're putting on cabaret shows left and right now. We're trying to kill. They're singing Wednesdays at 9 o'clock. You know. And there was a senator back years ago, I, I, you all know Sam Nunn from Georgia. He actually said, what if you're in a bunker and it's very close quarters, you're being shot at and bombs are falling on top of you, then you find that the soldier next to you is gay, then what? What do you mean, then what? <laughs> I don't think we're being bombed and shot at brings up people's romantic intentions. You know. What's the guy going to say? I know we're being attacked, but you're very attractive, actually. <laughs> it never occurred before. Somehow the glow from the shelling brings you out. <laughs> I mean, we have to be tolerant. And in, in Israel, they've had gay people in the, in the military for forever, you know. And, and so tolerance isn't, you can't pick and choose. It has to be, you know, for everybody. And, uh, and I, I think it's so important, uh, as I'm sure that, all of you in the Duluth community do is this a lot of interfaith stuff when we we're back at Temple Israel's interfaith event and 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 this and so many other things and it's so important to to be with people from other religions and I uh, had the pleasure and privilege of uh, performing in a mosque uh, a couple of times and how many of us have been to uh, a mosque um, and as you know you know when you go to a mosque you have to take your shoes off uh, and I was very happy to do that to respect the ritual and the other comedian, it wasn't Dean, it was kind of a wise guy, said, yeah, uh, I don't have to take my shoes off, I'm, I'm TSA pre. So just. <laughs> they knew it was a joke and it was fun. And uh, by the way, this is the exaggerated, with the times, I'm not on TSA pre, but I once in a while get it. We get this exaggerated sense like you're king of the world, like I can leave my shoes on. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the greatest, like it's like everything. All your problems melt away. Like, I don't have to take out the little bag. It's incredible, you know. Maybe it's just me, but I just feel. Uh, um, and it was so wonderful. I got to perform with four African-American Muslim comedians. And it was nice that for a change, I was the one providing diversity on the show. <laughs> so uh, that was a wonderful thing. And I, uh, you know, in this show, you know, I, I'm a news junkie, a political junkie, but this isn't a partisan thing because I know, you know, Growing up in New York State and here in uh, Minnesota, many great people from all parties, and um, but there's no party or there should be no place for hate, and that's uh, you know uh, sadly what we what we have. And uh, I feel a little guilty though um, uh, because I did uh, shop at Trump Tower once uh, recently because I had a no, I was walking around and I had to buy sheets and uh, they had a white uh, supremacy sale and. Uh, <laughs> So, no, but I'm guilty about everything Jewish. When the Mueller report came out, I blame myself. Going, maybe I should have done more. I didn't watch MSNBC the last two months. I could have done something. And, uh, you know. um, but I live in, in Brooklyn, in, uh, right near Brighton Beach. If you know Brighton Beach or Brooklyn, which is 100% uh, Russian. So I'm guilty of collusion with Russians. Every, you know. How much is the orange? Okay, fine. You know, so that's in a very happy way though, but, um, and uh, you know, we look back and there was a time when it was more hopeful and uh, President Obama uh, certainly was, it was completely different. He left office with the highest approval rating of any sitting president, I think it was like 52% and uh, I think uh, Trump's now is around 36%, not even percent, just 36. <laughs> Uh, and this isn't to bash him or anything, and he, uh, it's just, you know, the things he said. I mean, you know, here we are trying to bring people together, which he's not very good at, and Charlottesville was such a uh, nightmare. He basically said, well, 
there's bad people on both sides. And finally, we have a leader who's you know, not afraid to, you know, to not paint all Nazis with a broad brush. You know, sort of, as so many people do. You know, no, there, maybe some people are in it for the logo. You know, we don't know, so. Uh, you know, and then, um, just the other day, he said that the, uh, he's in good shape because the military is with him. And right after that, Maduro from Venezuela sued for plagiarism. So it just, it, it, you can't say these things, so. But I think in general, I, wouldn't you agree, whatever our party, our background, ideology, that just to say that you vote for a guy because he says what's on his mind isn't a good enough reason. Because a lot of people say, I, I, he says what's, saying what's on your mind is the least unique trait any human being can have. You know? There are billions of people on this earth who say what's on their mind. Many of them, I saw the other day on the subway in New York, they were just saying what's on their mind to themselves, sadly, but. Uh, so, uh, but I, you know, I think that uh, the most important thing, and I'm gonna do something, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I feel close to all of you. I'm gonna say something political that I guarantee you, every single person here will agree with. I think it's, I'm glad this is gonna be preserved. Uh, uh, here I go, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that everybody should vote. There we go. Okay, I think we pretty much got everyone. And I love voting, I just vote, you know, I. I I remember one time I, I went to vote, a primary, and I got to the school, it's true, there was a sign that said, primary election canceled, no contested races. Signed, Vladimir Putin. It was very nice. It's a... But shouldn't we make voting a little easier and uniform and, and early voting and, and, and all that and end voter suppression and uh, all that? And Because and, uh, every state's different. Minnesota, I guess you fill in. Thing. And I, in New York, we do that. I think Montana is a little different. You have to carve wood to indicate the vote. And I think Idaho, you peel a potato. There's some, it's, it's all very different. And, but I'm sure I could just tell that you're all civic-minded. You go out and vote. And, uh, um, and uh, you've had great people in Minnesota. And I thought Al Franken was a wonderful senator. I had the pleasure of working with him. And, uh, and frankly, the only way I'd vote for Kirsten Gillibrand if she picked Al as her running mate but uh, probably won't happen, but. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it, you know, it's important. And uh, I forgot I forgot what I was gonna say because I was just uh, thinking about that. But uh, yeah, no, you guys vote. Not every state is a civic minded. I, in Virginia recently, this is true. You know what the turnout in one election was? 3%. 3% 3, 3 is the margin of error in a poll, so it's actually possible no one voted. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's something that we, uh, you know, need to do. And, uh, um, but, you know, as, uh, you know, as comedians, I think we, we are optimists, even with the Middle East. I think that um, hopefully, and I'm surprised there haven't been peace talks yet because we have one of the finest diplomats uh, running the Middle East, Jared Kushner, Really, his experience and depth of and breadth of experience in diplomacy is zero. But you know, it's a, he's he's a real estate landlord. He's good at evicting people. Maybe that's his strategy. I don't know. Uh, but I think one of the problems with the peace talks is the food never looks appetizing. Uh, like uh, it looks like this usually. It's like two glasses of water and a fig. You know, maybe they want peace, but they're hungry and they go elsewhere. So, um, so hopefully, uh, you know. That will happen, and and, uh, and I hope we get to the point too. We can realize we could criticize without people just attacking you and calling your names, and and you know, um, and uh, I had disagreements with the Israeli government, but I went to the Salute Israel parade uh, last year, and uh, actually Prime Minister Netanyahu was there. He didn't march; he just built settlements along Fifth Avenue. Uh, was never in, he was in the neighborhood, you know. Why not? I mean, who could afford them? Yeah, very expensive. But uh, so. But optimistic, and there's other reasons to be uh, optimistic, and um, I think good things are happening. I, I think we, comedians are practical. I think that, uh, like here, here's an example. I think we should take the insurance companies uh, out of healthcare and put them to work for the Defense Department. Because I think this would lead to world peace. You know, it would be great. It'd be like, um, let me see, uh, 30,000 more troops in Afghanistan. Um, let me check, can't. Uh, pre-existing war, 
can't, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that, so I think a lot of these optimists about it, and keep, like I said, we're practical. I think, uh, you know, sadly, we're still drug epidemic and the opioid crisis, and, but what I think we should do to try to help socially conscious thing is if someone's a drug addict, to give them clean needles so they don't get diseases, right? I think that makes sense. And some people say, no, no, you can't give out clean needles to drug addicts. It'll encourage people to do drugs. Many of you sitting around tonight going, I'm glad Scott brought that up. I'm considering becoming a heroin addict. It's, uh, well, it's the hygiene that concerns me. <laughs> you know, if you drop the syringe, does the five second rule apply? <laughs> Which is why there are very few Jewish intravenous drug users who are too neurotic about the whole process. You know, it's, like, it's like, I bought the heroin, um, the seal was broken. Is it still, um, can I return it? I, I don't have the receipt. Uh, um, could I, in, in lieu, could I return it for a drug of equal or lesser value? Uh, in that case, would the Groupon still apply? And you know, we get nervous. Is, uh, what is it, what's the use by date? March 3rd, is that use by? Uh, can I freeze the heroin? Does it keep? Is it kosher for Passover? You know, these are the things uh, we worry about. But, um, and, uh, but again, I think there's reason to even in our own personal lives, I was married, I'm not married now, I'd like to get married again, uh, maybe in Duluth, maybe I'll settle here in, in Duluth and, uh, you know, um, and uh, the, uh, yeah, I, I think that, well, how many of you have been to a, a Jewish wedding ceremony? Have, um, yeah. Now, those of you who haven't, or, or those of you who have, you probably wondered why, do you know what the, the integral part of a Jewish wedding ceremony is? You, you break a glass, which, as I mentioned earlier, is like the source of fear for all Jews. Why would they pick a glass, which we dread, to symbolize the happiest moment of your life? And um, so anyway, I, uh, I'll drink one of these. Um, I usually don't drink on stage, but we had a lovely dinner before. How many of you were at the dinner at the reception? And, uh, very nice. And I talked throughout the dinner, so I have no voice left. But anyway, uh, I drink the lower water. But... Um, so um, the, uh, it's a wonderful thing, a Jewish wedding ceremony, and, and, uh, uh, and you have to find, you know, and the reason, I found out the reason, and the rabbi here knows obviously, but in the Jewish religion, at moments of great happiness, this is why we have to break the glass, at moments of great happiness, we must be reminded of great sadness. All right, wow, thanks, Jews. Wow, I really, okay, I thought I found that one of my dreams. Let's bring it down a little bit, you know. I mean, really, why dwell about love and happiness when alternatively you could think about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, you know, which, which many people do, by the way. I was talking to my friend the other day. I said, hey, feel, eh, a little depressed. Why? Eh, destruction of the temple in 70 AD. It just, it, it comes and goes, you know. So. But literally, you have to go to places to find a glass for this. I mean, they have stores, Judaica stores, where you go, and it's called glass to break. And... Uh, I didn't know this, and that, you know, because I didn't know maybe what kind of glass to get. I mean, uh, you know, some people say uh, light bulbs. Have you heard that? And, you know, and I'm an energy conscious person. Should I get an energy saver? Uh, you know, you know, a three-way bulb is probably inappropriate. Uh, you know. <laughs> we'll delete that from there. I think that, that's as blue as I get, and, it, and it's... You could say that on the view, so it's really not. But, uh, but uh, no, I am. By the way, not just any. I am a green comedian, and and, and I love the, the the farm to table. Yeah, green. No, I, I am a green comedian. I recycle all my material. Uh, <laughs> I separate the political from the Jewish, and so it's really it's uh, very important. And uh, um, so actually, my ex-wife was is very involved with sustainable agriculture. I don't have I don't have a joke, but that's part of the settlement. Just to mention her, but uh, no, no. Uh, and actually she was, uh, she's in, uh, you know, very important sustainable agriculture. She's in nonprofit and I'm a comedian, so I'm also in nonprofit. And um, <laughs> so we had that great bond uh, there for a while. But uh, no, but the Jewish wedding, it's a wonderful uh, ceremony and, uh, and I hope to experience it again. And there is one thing though, that it, the commonality 
uh, every wedding you sign a wedding contract, right? Uh, in a Jewish wedding, uh, in, it's called a ketubah. That's Hebrew, ketubah. You know what it is in Arabic? Chatubah. I mean, that's the difference between Israelis and Arabs, a little phlegm. <laughs> if we clear our throats, we'll have peace in the Middle East. You know? And I believe there will be one thing, and another way before I bring out Dean is that we, anytime there's a war, uh, they always have the money for it, right? You know, and they don't need authorization. They never go, oh, we, well, I want to invade this country. Nah, we don't have the money, we can't do it. You know? But then it's like, how about free tuition? No, what are you crazy, Medicare for all? I can't afford that, but killing people, I've got a few dollars, yeah, I've got the money. Um, and then we, there's so many good causes, and then we, uh, have to have telethons for the good causes. Now, a few years ago, I was on this cerebral palsy telethon. I'm sure you all saw me. It's not from about 3 to 7 in the morning. And uh, it was a, a big career move. And I think that's what caught Tom's attention. He saw me on that. We got to sit through all these people for 25 hours just to raise 50, 60 million for a great cause. I mean, why can't the government shell out the 50, 60 million for cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis? And how about making the Defense Department have a telethon? If they want to attack countries for no reason, fine. Let them get up and sing for it. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to say, hi, we have a lot of countries we'd love to invade, but we can't do it unless those phones are ringing. <laughs> Pick up a phone now. And, uh, thank you so much. You're wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, right now, um, I'd like to bring out my... Uh, Back, my great friend and my partner in comedy and in peace, Dean Obadala. How about a nice round of applause for Scott Blakeman? Oh my gosh. I, again, I've got to tell. By the way, is anybody here Muslim? Any Muslims? One? Where? Welcome. Salam alaikum. How are you? Anybody else? That was it. You were yelling for this. All right, welcome. Made you sit in the back, that's not fair, all right. <laughs> What's going on there, Tom? So, uh, see, we don't, see, Muslims, we don't start things on time. We have our own time. I, I call it, I'm sorry? I call it inshallah time. Now, if you don't know, how many people here know what inshallah means? Some people. Inshallah, <laughs> inshallah means God willing, or the will of, it's also a magical word, it means many things. Muslims know it means no and maybe and a lot of things. Muslims use the term inshallah in situations God really wouldn't care. I was at a restaurant in Jordan, my king. I asked the waiter, where's the bathroom? He goes, it's just over there. I go, I'll be right back. He goes, inshallah. I'm like, what has happened to your bathroom that I need God's protection? He's like, Habibi, let me hug you, my friend. So I live in New York where most people know inshallah, which is remarkable. They also know curses in Arabic, which is, again, remarkable. I so how many people have been to New York? I imagine most of the audience. New York's a great city. Duluth is beautiful. New York's slightly faster paced. Uh, I was on the bus, and a guy in a suit and tie was using a metric card to pay for the bus. He put it in the machine the wrong way three times in a row. At this moment, a homeless guy on the bus screams out, come on, I got things to do. <laughs> this is New York City. The homeless have things to get done. I love the diversity of New York City. I love all the people, immigrants, work hard. Here people ask me, how is comedy different now, before, now and as opposed to before Trump? Before Trump, I swear, I'd say to audiences, who's from other countries? People go like, we are. Now I go, who's from other countries? People go, they are, right there. A little, a little unnerving. And my uh, fiance, I'm getting married, by the way, thank you. And uh, you don't need to applaud. Getting married, inshallah, it's up to God when we're gonna. But she's, I, I met her on a dating website called eBay. Uh, <laughs> she's actually from the Middle East. She's, she's born in Israel, she's Israeli, but she's Palestinian. She's Palestinian Muslim, but ethnically Palestinian, Israeli citizen. She was on Sesame Street in Israel. She played uh, a Simpson, as you call it's called Simpson. She played Ifti Sam, a smiling character, on that. And it was good, like they didn't make her kidnap Elmo or anything, it was kind of nice. <laughs> And she's doing well as an actress in America. There are challenges. She was in a Broadway play. She was on Homeland. Everybody knows Homeland. She had a really good role. And even though she's Arab, they did not make her play a terrorist, which is nice. 
She played the wife of a terrorist. <laughs> and she does commercials and voiceovers. But there's one place in America she will not get hired, simply because of who she is. Do you guys ever use relaxation tapes? You know what they are? Like, get them on iTunes, very calm. She shows out very soothing. It says things like, breathe in, breathe out. You have nothing to worry about. Everything's going fine. That's soothing. But she has an Arabic accent. And Americans won't relax hearing, breathe in, <laughs> breathe out. You have nothing to worry about. Everything's going according to plan. <laughs> Say the same thing with or without an Arabic accent, and it becomes scary. That's what's remarkable. This is, what our, this is how we're conditioned in this country to be afraid. Now, I'm learning Arabic. Where, by the way, what's your background ethnically? What's your background ethnically? Moroccan? Moroccan. So I'm, do you speak Arabic? Are you from Morocco? All right. So you speak Arabic fluently. And I'm learning Arabic from my fiance. Here's what I found. When she can't translate something from English to Arabic, she'll just say the word in English with an Arabic accent like I didn't notice. <laughs> like I asked her, how do you say dog? She's like, kel. I'm like, how do you say cat? She's busy. I go, how do you say penguin? She looks at me and she goes, penguin. I'm like, that sounds like English. She goes, do not tell me my language. <laughs> do not piss her off. So for me, like some people say I don't want to be partisan. For me, I'm not partisan when I talk about Donald Trump. It's personal. It's not like some academic discussion about policies. This is a man who literally called to ban everyone in my faith group and my family does not live in this land and got a huge cheer for it. And what, what's funny to me about Trump's ban, this is completely true. When they asked Trump, and I'm not making this up, during the campaign, how will you know if someone at customs is Muslim so they can find an ISIS guy? So he goes, how will, we know, how will you know? And he knows his answer was, he goes, we'll just ask them their religion. That'll do it, because guys in ISIS are never going to lie. <laughs> like, what's your religion? What to me? What to my? I am an Episcopalian. <laughs> it's like, really? We're not getting that from you. Okay, I am a Buddhist. <laughs> Prove it. Uh, Buddha Akbar. <laughs> I follow politics too closely. I have to admit that. How many people here follow politics very closely? Closely? I follow... Trump is aging me, folks. Look at me, I'm 23. Look what he's done to me. <laughs> he just had his, this is so true, he just had his physical like three weeks ago. His blood pressure is lower than mine. And the irony, mine is higher because of him. This is what's going on. <laughs> like I need some kind of Trumpetin, some kind of medicine to deal with Trump. And it's also, it's not just Trump. Let's be blunt. Trump did not invent anti-Muslim bigotry. It's been percolating for years on the right. For years, in certain states, I'm not sure if Minnesota tried it, Republicans would try to pass these things, these bans on Sharia law. Nobody, no Muslim in America is trying to impose Islamic law. They know that. They even admit that. But they do that to scare people. And they, you know what they call it? They don't call it Islamic law. In the laws they propose, they call it foreign law. Foreign. Because at the end, Islam is foreign. But Jesus was born in Iowa. and then wrapped in an American flag and driven home in a pickup truck while Toby Keith was playing. <laughs> Guess where Jesus comes from? The same place Moses and Abraham and Muhammad, they all, they're all imported to this religion, this land. The only religion that's indigenous to this land are Native American religions, not any of our religions. Let's be blunt, that's the reality. But we're the, I'm foreign, Muslims are foreign. Do you know when the first Muslims came to America? 10 to, 10 to 15 percent were slaves. They came here, if you saw Roots, the, the original one you probably didn't see, him, but the second one, when they redid it, or read the book by Alex Haley, his, Kunta Kinte was Muslim. He went back and found that his relatives were Muslim. They came here and they helped build this country. But now we're foreign and we're demonized. So for me, when I talk about Trump, it's not left and right, it's just right and wrong. And to me, it's, it's heartbreaking what he's done to so many communities. We've seen a spike in hate crimes. It's heartbreaking to see Jews, Muslims, blacks, LGBT facing this because you have someone who emboldens them by not denouncing them. And that's the reality. So it's not about, if you're a Republican, I completely respect you. It's the Trumpians that, that break my heart. And I hope we can reach them somehow. And it's, you know, people say to me, do, do I miss like Obama? How many people here miss Obama? At this point, I miss Dick Cheney, okay? <laughs> like, if Cheney, I would hug Dick, I'm like, come here. You were just misunderstood, all right? Mussolini's looking better by the hour, okay? It's how bad this is we're going through. I, you know, I miss, now I miss Bush selfishly because as a comedian, he was great for my career. I really started doing comedy 
during the Bush age. And what was remarkable, this is true, it's not like with Trump. Even Republicans had no problem laughing at Bush because he had a sense of humor. He would laugh at himself. And I used to do so many Bush jokes. I'll do one. And it's based on what Bush really did. He would say things. When he gave a speech, he would slow down his speech pattern inexplicably in the middle of it. And I have a theory why. Like he would say things like, you got to start developing alternative fuel sources so that we are no longer dependent on foreign oil. And then I think, why did he talk like that? And then it occurred to me, that's probably the way it was explained to him. Because he wasn't that bright, but he knew he wasn't that bright. That's George Bush would never say, I'm the smartest guy and stuff. No, no, he understood his limitations. He was affable and, and a, a good human being, except for certain things. Uh, so I don't know where politics goes in the future. I'm hoping for the best for all of us, whatever that might be. So I'm of mixed heritage. My mom's Italian. Anybody Italian? Any Italians here? Italian? All right, we got a few. The rest of you, can you relate to being Italian? Have you been to the Olive Garden? Anyone? <laughs> Ever worn a tank top to a job interview? Anybody? <laughs> Just my mom? My mom's Sicilian. Anybody Sicilian? Any? You're Sicil How much Sicilian? All or mixed? 100%. That's like my mom. That's too much Sicilian. <laughs> that, is, that is OK. All right. You see more? OK. So who else is Sicilian? Someone else? Are you 100% or mixed? Half. That's what I'm half now. It should always be diluted. It is my mom. <laughs> you don't know Sicilians. Talk to Sicilians. Like they're loving, caring, difficult people is the nicest way I can put it. <laughs> Just being honest. And here's the difference between Sicilians and Arab. Anybody, of, you're of Moroccan. Anybody else of Arab heritage at all? Anybody else? Have, here's the difference though between Arabs and Italians. Okay, here's the difference between Al Qaeda and the Mafia. It's when something bad happens. Guys in Al-Qaeda call up and claim responsibility for everything, for things they couldn't do. Like, okay, do you know the eclipse? We did it for Allah. We're keeping the sun. <laughs> Guys in the mafia deny responsibility for everything. They're like, officer, I don't know. I think he shot himself in the back four or five times. <laughs> A different world. And for me, my dad's Palestinian. He was born in what was then Palestine in the 1930s and came here in the mid-50s and brought his family over here. And for me, you know, it's interesting. Living in New York, post 9-11 changed my life. All of our lives changed after 9-11 on some way. It, it simply is when you go to the airport, what happens? For me, sim I'll put it this way, and I'm not kidding. Before 9-11, I was really like a white guy. I mean, I know what my heritage was, but no one referred to me as Arab American. And, you know, I tell people, like, on September 10th, I went to sleep a white guy. September 11th, I woke up an Arab. And that was the world that changed around. Like pre 9 11, all my friends were white. All, they all had names like Monica and Chandler and Joey. <laughs> After 9 11, I'm Arab guy, I'm Muslim guy. Everyone, media, everyone called me that. I couldn't understand. Everything changed around me. And people would have comments, especially in New York, they would try to connect. They're like, oh, you're Arab. You know, I love hummus. <laughs> like, thank you, I invented that. But they were trying to be nice. I had no problem with, even if it seemed a little weird, I was happy. Other people would say things like, I'm not even kidding, like someone said, I'm like, I'm Arab. They, and many people would go, oh, but you look so normal. <laughs> and that meant white. That's what they were saying. I look like a white person then. They didn't mean it in a hateful way. They were just sharing. I was on Fox News Radio with Brian Kilmeade. And I've been on with Brian a few times. And he's not a bad guy. And he actually asked me, he was just being honest. He goes, he goes so Dean, you're Arab and Muslim. He goes, how many terrorists do you think there are? That's what he said to me. I'm like, 83? I have no idea, Brian. <laughs> and because I don't look like an Arab to most people, people have no problem saying horrible things to my face about my own background. And if you do not look like what people think your background is, they will say things to your face. You don't have to be Arab to experience this. So I'm in New York, and I'm in a, a pizza parlor. TV's on, CNN's on. And this guy goes, hey, buddy, see these freaking Arabs on TV? Oh, yeah? He goes, I got an idea. Let's kill them all and let God sort it out. That's what he said to me. I'm like, sir, that's not nice. I'm of Arab heritage. He goes, you don't freaking look it. I'm like, well, that just makes it easier for me to achieve the goals of my mission. It's a mission of comedy. Take that off. Look, I'm a Muslim comedian. The FBI's been transcribing my act for years. This is nothing. 
I had just no, not seen it done in front of me before. I mean, <laughs> the NYPD in New York literally was spying at colleges where I was performing, not just because of me, they were spying on the Muslim students. So I'm sure the NYPD's got tons of this stuff. I'm not even kidding. That's the world we live in. White people, you're so lucky. You're never defined by the worst examples in your community. That's the truth between being a minority and being, because it's not skin color. I still look white, but I am defined by the terrorists. I have to answer for them. I have to apologize for them. I have to denounce them. White people, you're lucky. No one goes up to you and asks you to answer for the worst white people. No one goes, hey, what's up with Justin Bieber? You never have to deal with that stuff. <laughs> That's our world. That's my world. My world is fighting against the worst stereotypes of people I've never met in my life, but I happen to share a faith with. That's what it's like being a minority. If you're black, uh, Latino, or immigrant, that's the same experience we all go through. Now, it could be more challenging for Muslims. I always look at the bright side. They could give hurricanes Muslim names. That wouldn't help. <laughs> Turn on the news, Hurricane Mahmoud is coming. <laughs> Run for your life, Mahmoud's a killer. I'm like, oh. See the headlines, Mahmoud kills 30. I'm like, oh, this is not good. I have an uncle. <laughs> like, Amu, stay in, do not come out. That would not be helpful. I've traveled a lot. I, I, I really don't have problems at the airport. I'm not sure, uh, you know, if you have Middle Eastern friends, they, they may or may not. You know, my name is legally Dean. My father wanted to name me Salahuddin. My mom wanted me to be able to fly on a plane in America. <laughs> so we went with Dean. <laughs> and I have friends who go to the airport, and still to this day, they get picked for random screening. And they asked me why. And I had a friend who went to the airport wearing a shirt in Arabic that said, we will not be silent. I'm like, you will not be flying with this shirt. <laughs> here's my advice for people. If you're a Middle Eastern, you know any. Here's advice, less problems at the airport. Remember this expression. Dress white, make your flight. <laughs> dress brown, never leave town. <laughs> and what's dress white? Like khaki pants and a polo shirt. If you have for some little animal, like a tiger, <laughs> alligator, no camel, no camel. La, 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 okay. And if, if someone has a Middle Eastern accent and TSA asks you questions, throw in words from other languages so they don't know where you're from. It's curious, like, where are you going? It's like, where am I going? Mosheri. <laughs> to see my mama me and have a fajita, mazel tov. <laughs> like, genius, let this person through. This is the world we live in. And I made a documentary. Scott was actually in it. A documentary called The Muslims Are Coming. It's on iTunes. You can watch for $3. John Stewart's actually in it as well. And what the, the whole premise of the movie, we had five Muslim comedians. And we went to the South to do all free comedy shows to meet people. We went to, there's five of us went to Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama. Three of us made it back. Uh, <laughs> we're going to miss them. But you can watch the documentary. Rachel Maddow's in it. A lot of great people are in it. A lot of comedians. Louis Black, David Cross talking about things, but the communities we went down to talk to people and answer questions, we also did very Americana things just to meet people. Because in America, most people don't know a Muslim. Polls show maybe 30 to 35% of Americans. So we did bowling with a Muslim, which was fun. We paid for people to bowl. We did shooting guns with a Muslim, which in retrospect was not a good idea. <laughs> we literally did that. I'm not kidding. You can see it's in the documentary. We went to a shooting range. I know nothing about shooting. How many people here shoot guns? You guys shoot guns? Is that part of the culture in Duluth? A couple, a few people. I, I'm in Georgia. You can see the document. If you give your driver's license in Georgia, they will give you any gun. So they hand me a Glock. It's a handgun. My hand is shaking. The woman goes, "Don't you got shooting ranges in New York?" I go, "We have Brooklyn." <laughs> and she's like, "No, this is inside." So I go inside, and there's a family shooting guns. A kid, like 10 years old, with his dad and mom, dressed like Woody from Toy Story, having fun. So I'm like, if he can do it, I'm gonna try. And then I was shooting guns, and I'm the most liberal guy. I have to be honest, it was fun. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm shooting side, I have no idea what I'm doing though. I'm shooting other people's targets, I'm like, look at this. I'm acting out scenes from like The Godfather because I'm half Sicilian. The problem is I know nothing about gun safety. And on the Glock, the hammer can come back and catch your thumb, there's a pitch point. I didn't know there's a pitch point. All of a sudden I'm bleeding. And I go, oh my God, I shot myself. <laughs> Like, my destiny cannot be dying in a shooting range in Georgia. And the little kid looks at me and goes, it was just the recoil, you baby. <laughs> I never wanted to shoot a kid before that moment. Like, I'm armed, kid. 
And I've, done, I've never done comedy in Morocco. I've done countless shows in the Middle East, from Egypt. I produced a comedy festival in Jordan for three years. I produced from, from Egypt to even Saudi Arabia. There was comedy there. And in Oman, a, little, a beautiful country, Dubai, of course. There's so much more we have in common, especially the young people. They watch YouTube, and they're on Facebook with all of us. They see our world instantaneously. They know more about us than we know about them. It's actually building more bridges from their side to our side than vice versa. And there are differences, though. That's what I noticed. Like, does anybody here smoke cigarettes? Anyone smoke cigarettes? Do you smoke cigarettes? No? One per Almost no one. I went to Jordan. I went to a gym. There was an ashtray on the treadmill. It's like, I feel the burn. He didn't hear it, my friend. <laughs> they love smoking. It's a different, that's a cultural difference. That's a, one of the big ones. Um, like, traffic is insane. Have you ever been to Egypt? So how is traffic in Morocco? A lot of traffic? Car traffic? A lot. Egypt. If you had a GPS for time of arrival, it would actually say, Inshallah. <laughs> It'd actually be up to God, because you have no idea. Everything in Egypt is like, leave now. You'll be there in 30 minutes or Tuesday. We have no idea. And all the American chains, and I'm sure in, in Morocco, the American McDonald's is there. Starbucks, as Arabs call it. They call it Starbucks. <laughs> There's one chain, though, not in the Middle East where I've gone. I think it's actually good it's not there. Target. Because <laughs> nobody wants a bullseye and the word Target on the front of their store. <laughs> They don't want some guy nice is going, what are we supposed to blow up today? Oh, my gosh. Super Tiger Habibi, this is very, very good. We're going to get a promotion. <laughs> no, we're kidding. And I asked New York, anybody from New Jersey, my home state, my original home state, anyone? You've been in New Jersey, one person? Did you live there? Oh, you just traveled through. It's funny, with the students, I said, anyone from New Jersey? And a girl raised her hand. I go, where? She goes, we just drove through once on the way to New York. I'm like, that, <laughs> that didn't make me feel better. I grew up in a place called Lodi, New Jersey, where there were literally two ethnic groups. You were either my father, you were either Italian or my dad. That was the entire thing. And the kids had an accent, New Jersey. I probably have a slight Jersey accent to you guys. Do I have one? A little? I was worse when I was younger. So my dad has an accent, the Jersey kids have an accent. And when they met, there was this confusion. The kids were like, yo, Mr. Obadala, what's going on? How you doing? What's going on? My dad's like, I don't know. What is going on? <laughs> Dean, what is happening? Are things going happening? And the kids from Jersey like, your dad gets such a freaking weird accent. Where's he from? I'm like, well, he was born in Palestine. Like, oh, southern Jersey. <laughs> I'm like, no, the Middle East. Like, like Ohio? Parts of Ohio. Toledo has a lot of Arab. <laughs> Toledo does. I actually did a thing there with Jamie Farr years ago. He goes, I know Jamie Farr from now who's Lebanese. He has a golf classic. I was, he had me as the comedian once. He was a nice guy. Very nice guy. Um, Danny Thomas, who's long past, but he's from there as well. So, all right, before we get we'll do another joke or two, because we have time for their, our Q&A. So Scott and I are optimists as comedians. That, that's what we do. That's what we believe in. And, you know, perhaps, against all odds, perhaps some lasting peace deal, a just peace deal is the key to a Middle East peace, can actually happen in the Middle East. And if it happens with Benjamin Netanyahu and Abu Mazen, not only do they get the Nobel Peace Prize, we know that, I think they would be rewarded with commercial endorsements worldwide. <laughs> Hear me out. Inshallah, we're in the future and there's peace. You turn on TV and say, hello, I am Benjamin Netanyahu. And I am Abu Mazen. For over 60 years, we fought each other tooth and nail. In fact, we hated each other very much. But through it all, we always agreed on one thing. The great taste of Miller Lite. <laughs> Less filling tastes great. Less filling, now we just fight about beer. It's so much better. All right, thank you very much. Let's bring Scott Blakeman back up here. <laughs> yes, Scotty, thank you, buddy. You make Dean Ovidala. Yay, it's still me. I got to uh, just tell Dean that you did a great job. I was watching the screen. It's a whole other show, actually. And uh, uh, I got to give you the material they came up with. I the... took a picture and sent it to you of, you, of the words. I'm oh, not really? kidding. While you're on stage for you. It's, it's a remarkable thing. We've never seen this. All the years you've done comedy. I, this is the most remarkable. amazing. We will never forget this. Yeah. <laughs> Tom will forget in a minute. But this. This is incredible. Uh -huh. I, Oh, this is, well, I'm not kidding. And you know what the funniest thing is? Tom said to me before the show, you won't even notice the screens. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's what he told me. <laughs> so I walk in, I'm like, right. what am I, blind? I'm not going to make a Nothing here, nothing to see. <laughs> yeah. 
You really did. You're telling me you won't even notice the screens unless you go out of your way to look at them. That's what, yeah. The good thing is we got to take them home with us, so that was a nice perk, I think. So. Yeah, carry on. Which one? Uh, being the That's your one. Okay, because, well, you know. I am the higher status water. <laughs> well, uh, we, we do want to, uh, first of all, wonderful. This is really just, I mean, as uh, a mitzvah, as we would say, really, because uh, this is the first time ever in the 15 years we've been doing the show that we had the opportunity for two shows in this beautiful auditorium and to have the wonderful freshmen, and I'm not saying it to, patronized because they're not here. They're incredible kids, a great audience, and smart and wonderful, and, and all of you who work at the school should take credit for that and their families. And, uh, and you tonight, just to be part of the community, because, you know, we talk about getting to know people and spilling water, and uh, see, that's why I never drink on stage, because I can't do more than one thing. At a time. Now I'm guilty that I have the water. And, uh, so anyway, the, uh, but, you know, I try to look within myself, and we have our own prejudices or misconceptions, and, you know, to my friends, you know, I send pictures, Duluth, all it is, Duluth, isn't that the coldest place in the, in the entire earth, you know? And what people realize is that, you know, wonderful, smart, progressive communities everywhere, and, and it's, it's, it's such a pleasure uh, being here and to, to meeting I all of you. I think it is the coldest place in the earth. Well, that, that is true. <laughs> uh, but the maybe the peace talk should be here. I think this could be, you know. You know. No one can leave. <laughs> You know, so I think that's what, yeah. So let, let's see, if anyone has any questions or, or comments, uh, suggestions, or questions, anything, we'd love to hear from you. And, and I do and, and while you're thinking, because I know it's a hard right. thing to do, I'll say, because uh, I did mention how we met, but I also wanted to say that we performed at the Seeds of Peace camp. How many of you are familiar uh, with that? It's a wonderful camp uh, where Israelis and Palestinian teenagers come together, and or Indians and Pakistanis, people from warring nations in Maine, and of course, they get along because they're in Maine, but you know, it's a, but it's a wonderful thing. We were the only comedians ever invited uh, in 2005 to perform there, and uh, so it was a, a wonderful experience. And and you know, something I remember distinctly: the very first show we did was a fundraiser for Seeds of Peace, That's how we and the the Israelis, Palestinians there, and, and the head of Seeds of Peace brought the kids over and said, "Which one's Israeli? Which one's Palestinian?" Couldn't, had no idea. So I mean, it, it's it's just. And saying, as, as, as Dee knows, I mean, in this country, we all live together peacefully, and it's 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 a it's a sad slow motion tragedy because it's not as hard a problem, and we've been talking about it for 15 years, and it ebbs and flows, and it's not a great moment in it now, but I think that you just need people with the will to change things, and uh, uh, if if you were the guys in charge, and if the freshmen today were in charge, we'd have peace, but so hopefully we'll get to that. The interesting thing is when we go to colleges a lot, the question is, and what sometimes older people ask, the, the, the question from college students is, how come they haven't reached the peace deal yet? Like, they're just stunned by it. And because you know, they'll read about in history other conflicts that have gone on for years and been resolved. I'm like, why has it not been reached? And perhaps it takes the, 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 the optimism of the younger generation to have an impact on politicians. I'm, I'm not sure. But it is something good to hear from the younger people. So, anyone have any questions or, or comment? You can come up here. It would be and, the best actually, thing. students first, obviously. Uh, if you, um, I know it's kind of a long cakewalk <laughs> to go to the microphone. I would be nervous to ask. Go ahead. But or, or if you're really uncomfortable with that, and, you can yell you, it out, and we'll just you see, can if see your words picked up on. The, right. <laughs> or you we can write it down and uh, right see here. if that works. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, we just again we've been doing this 15 years, and and you know it's important. Just being in a room and having a civil discussion, I mean, I think it's so much, not the issues, but how we approach everything. And I was saying to the freshmen today that you know, your first day of school, when you meet somebody, you don't come up with the first thing in your mind that's going to annoy them or disagree with. And in life, you try to connect. If you're on a date, which I haven't had lately, but, but um, as I remember, you try to get along. And once you get to know someone and laugh with somebody, you can disagree and who cares, you know? Um, and, and that's, now everything is so personalized, and if you disagree, even I've had liberal friends who I agree with 99.9%, .9 and I say one thing off, oh, I can't believe it, you're an idiot, and so that's it. So, uh, And the one thing I would say, that when we discuss the Middle East, even if it's not here, obviously it's an emotional issue for people. And please be respectful of people who have different views on the Middle East, when you know it's coming from a place of truly trying to be constructive or advocating for their, their own emotional connection or personal connection to either Israel or Palestine. And sometimes we get lost in that and we become just 
yelling, and it becomes ugly. And I've written articles for the Daily Beast. I wrote one again just about a month ago that in the discussion of Palestine and Israel, that there should be no place for anti-Semitism in this discussion. And if you're an anti-Semite, I don't want you on the side of Palestinians trying to help my family. I don't want you on my side at all. And I would say, conversely, if someone is an anti-Muslim bigot, uh, that I hope that you will reject them as well if they would speak about the Middle East conflict in a way that's really about playing on anti-Muslim stereotypes or anti-Muslim tropes. There's, there's no, a place for neither. Let's find a place where we can have an actual discussion and then have an impact on our elected officials to maybe effectuate change. Perhaps we can do that. Or with grassroots organizations. I have my family members who are born, live their whole lives under occupation, and probably will die under occupation with less freedom of movement simply because of where they're born. And that's heartbreaking for me. And there should also be security for Israelis. Why should they worry, a mother worry about their child being hit from a, a missile from Gaza? And, and I hope that when we talk about the Middle East conflict, we talk about not just security for Israelis, that's all we hear. What about securities for Palestinians as well? It should be both sides, because maybe that different approach to the situation might find some common ground, because it's, it's working in these kind of lulls and then violence, and then lulls and then violence. How is that acceptable? If you're concerned with either Palestinians or Israelis, how is that acceptable? If you watch the conflict like this uh, uh, play out. And just very quickly, the status quo is not acceptable because it's bad for Israelis, bad for Palestinians, and um, you know there has to be a uh, change. But we'd love to hear your question. Let's see if it comes up here. Yes. <laughs> Could you please tell another joke about Jared Kushner? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, wow. it's, it's, requi it's comedy request time. I don't have any Kushner I never. Joke. Do you have any? I've never had request time before. It's wonderful, but uh, uh, look, I've been doing comedy for about 95 years, and, and I, I love the fact that you know Jared, who he is too, because most of us don't. All I would say about Jared Kushner again is that uh, I can't believe he's Jewish because he never talks. You, know? <laughs> you never hear him talk. The guy can't be he's the least Jewish Jewish guy I've ever seen. And uh, uh, but I would say to add to what Dean said too, it's you know the emotion takes over, and also. What we've said through this whole show, comedians were practical people. And it's so important to be practical. You're never going to figure out who really the land belongs to in any conflict. They don't have receipts. I don't think there's anything. I mean, we're not going to know. You could say, oh, this is my. Thing. No one knows. The point is, are you going to fight and kill for the rest of your life? Are you going to sit down? And there are, we, all the years we've been doing it, they came close with, before we did the show, with Bill Clinton. Uh, and, and, you know, they came close. The Oslo Accords, there's all these plans on the table. It's not some mysterious formula. You need the will. And, and, and any conflict that goes on this long, the truth is there's blame on all sides. And by all sides, I mean Americans too. We have a stake in this, the entire world. I mean the entire world. So to, to make this, you know, we always do this and there always, it's just not true. And one thing that's so important, speaking as a, a, a Jewish person, is that I... Uh, as offended as I am by anti-Semitic tropes, who's ever saying, and I'm also offended by other Jews who accuse me of being a self-hating Jew because I disagree with the current Israeli government. That's destructive, that's not helpful, and that's not being Jewish either, you know. And the Bible, when you read the prayer book, it says, seek peace and pursue it, and we should follow that. So that, that's one thing too. Being, uh, if uh, we poke fun at Trump, we're not anti-American, you know. So it, it, that has to be, and it has to be a, a dialogue, and that's what we try to do, bring people together. Uh, and you need to be in the same room, because I, I think a lot of people who spout all this hatred have never met people you know, who they're you know, criticizing or defaming. So I think that's an important uh, thing right it's, there. It's true. Their polls have shown people who actually know a Muslim or have a Muslim friend have a 20 to 25% more positive view of Islam and Muslims in general in America. Because it gets rid of the unknown. That's why, like for my community, we're so hard to try to get us more in the media. So we could be your, like on my radio show, I begin almost nightly, I want to be your MBFF, your Muslim best friend forever. Because <laughs> it's half jest, but it's, ha it's truthful, the idea of if you know a Muslim, if you know a minority, whatever that minority is, LGBT, Jewish in many places in this country where they're not Jewish people, uh, African American, Latino, the list goes on. It humanizes them. It changes. That's why people have said to us, like, that's why we want to, I remember I said it earlier in the, today, Katie Couric years ago, well-meaning, said to Muslims, she said publicly, you need a Muslim Cosby show. Now a Cosby-related thing is not good, but... <laughs> You're lucky you don't have a Muslim Cosby show. But at the time, she was absolutely 100% right, and she's still right, 
And there are now things coming out. There's a new project coming out on Hulu next month. My friend Rami Yusuf, a good friend of mine, it's the first TV series about a Muslim guy growing up in Jersey. He was born here, and it's about him navigating as a Muslim, living, trying to be truthful to his faith. It's funny. He's a comedian, but also living in New Jersey and dealing with that kind of stuff. And the big sick, I guess. Uh, the big sick in a way with Kamel Nanjiani, yeah. uh, who was raised Muslim, and, and others. But it just gets rid of the, the otherness. It makes it more real. Like, oh, I know at least one person of that group, and that you hope it chips away at the iceberg of misconception, because that's what it really, it's an iceberg of misconception. And, and there are still cases, too, of uh, white supremacists who actually convert. I mean, gay conversion therapy is, is a fraud and a horrible thing, but I there is they don't convert to Islam. I don't, no, no, but I don't want to. hope, so, yes. The, the social norm now seems to be that if you know the people you're socializing with have opposite views from you, then you don't talk about politics. What advice do you have if you don't have the great skills that you have to be a comedian and uh, create this wonderful atmosphere around it? How can people talk about it when that's what most people expect you to do? Interesting. Well, what I would say, one, you know, and every family probably has it, if there's somebody in the family and you love them despite it all, they're not going to listen. You're not going to have a reason. I would say just skip over and just talk about how bad the, the Knicks are or the, or the Rangers. But, uh, but I also think I have a friend, um, a comedian, and he's, uh, you know, very different views and, and pretty conservative. But he's very smart, and we have very civil conversations because we keep remembering we're friends. I like this person. And I think that's what, uh, I think that goes for any relationship. When you talk to a loved one, you're speaking you love this person, so you're not going to call them a name and walk out. So I think we need to, we should need to love the people we're conversing with. And I, don't, I think social media is not the best way to do it. I don't think this, I've ever been in the history of Facebook, a conversation where people said, oh, that's a good point, Scott. I didn't see it that way. Thank you. It's always, and so that, I stay off of that. I, I, I mean, I post cat photos and pose my family, but I don't engage there. But I think there's, there's ways to do it. And, and yes, you don't have to be a comedian to use humor. One of the scariest things about Donald Trump is that he never laughs. Uh, I think Al Franken pointed that out. And, and sense of humor is so important. And uh, of yourself, and you said George W. Bush, a very decent guy. Laugh at himself. Uh, a he very flawed problem. president. He's fun of himself. But, but he would have laughed at your joke, sure he would. even. And, and the Bush family, the, and you need that. So I think we need to have a sense of humor right. about everything, even though we're passionate about something. I, on my radio show, I had psychologists various times in the last two years come on, like before holidays, to, to give advice to people. How do you deal with that loved one you're going to see at the holidays who you disagree with fundamentally? Because you can't escape them. You're at Thanksgiving or it's the holidays. And it really comes one of two things. The one is you agree to ground rules. Like, look, if, I don't want to talk politics. Or if, I, it's important. Let's talk about it. But let's be respectful. At the outset, you set these ground rules. Like, no yelling, no screaming. Remember, we're the same family. You can do it with a friend. Let's remember, we're friends. We're going to have a discussion about this. If you don't know the person and you start with a debate thing, that's not going to be good. You've got to build that foundation of trust and then get to the higher issues. So from a psychologist, I'm just quoting who've been on my show, have talked about it. Setting ground rules at the outset, if, you're going to, if you want to engage, is probably the best way. And then if someone violates it, go, look, we're done. Let's just stop talking about this. Uh, in today's America, it's so sad when we disagree with people, we don't view them as fellow Americans we disagree with, we view them as the enemy. And that is permeating all of our politics and it's poisoning our toxic environment we live in now. And it's just getting worse and worse. And I don't know what will make it better, but screaming at each other and telling people they're un-American or get out of this country is not the answer. Uh, so We're on the same team. I and mean, that's the thing that I've noticed. You know, uh, there was always disagreements or something, but you know, I think America works best when we work together and there is this feeling of you know, right. you know, you liberals this or Hollywood is this, and and every and it, we need to just come together. So um, I guess oh, there. you can go first, and then you'll be. I, I didn't see who was first, but you'll both fight it out. So, yeah. How about the same time? <laughs> okay. um, you, Dean, talked about um, the difference between being playful and being hateful, mm -hmm. but I think there's a huge amount of gray area between the two of them. Sure. How do you know when a joke goes too far? How do you know when it's comedy and when it's too much. Do you mean in real life or like in a comedy setting, like I'm doing a comedy show? Because it's different. I guess, the world I guess is both. 
Because comedy world is artificial. People are coming to a comedy show. They understand it's a comedian. They know it's joking right at the top. And audiences tell you if you go too far. They, they moan or like, oh, God, and you get it. And there are comedians who do cringe humor on purpose, who push buttons on purpose. Um, if in real life, I think that you, if you hurt someone, you should apologize. And there's no other way around it. I mean, I, I can't. Tell someone, don't be offended by a joke I tell. I, I can't. I, I might not have any malice in my heart, and I tell a joke, and they're hurt by it. My answer to them is, I like, can't be like, oh, get over it. It's got to be acknowledging, hey, I'm sorry that joke hurt you. I, tell me why. And I've had conversations with people who said, not that it hurt them or they found something offensive in a joke, and I'd say, why? Explain to me why. I always want to listen, and I always you know, have that conversation with people. So I think it really comes from, if someone's really hateful and you know it, they're not gonna change. They're, they're gonna tell their jokes, they're gonna be mean-spirited, and that's who they are, we know that. The ones who, it's not by malice, it's by ignorance, have that conversation, talk to them, tell them. You'd be amazed if people, people are just not told sometimes that something they said is hurtful, not just comedy, just in the real world. And it was something we said to the students earlier today about speaking out, saying things, talk, pulling your friend aside and going, this is what, this hurt me, or this was so offensive to others and no one wanted to tell you. You'd be amazed at how many people are like, I didn't even know that. Why would that be? So that's the best advice that's I have. That's a good, that's decent answer. So you touched uh, briefly on the idea that once you get to know someone who's different, that that kind of humanizes them in a way. Um, and I guess a lot of people who aren't as familiar with certain people of different, um, who are different from them, they kind of resort to those offensive and demeaning stereotypes. How do you, um, kind of go about treating a person who kind of resorts to those stereotypes and isn't opening up to wanting to perceive anyone as different from those stereotypes. Well, maybe introduce them to, to someone who, you know, they, they just spout these stereotypes about and they've never really met. I think there's no substitute for, you know, as we said, are being you, Are, the same are group. you saying that even when they're exposed to the, the, the group that they're demonized, they won't change their views? Oh, even when... Oh, there's a word for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We don't have all those answers. If we had those answers, we'd be in a much. Uh, I don't know. I think if it's someone you think is deep down inside, there is some good there to keep working at it. I, I you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's some. Sometimes you have to step away with that, but hopefully everyone is reachable uh, that way. But I think that's the as you, yeah. you know, as I got older, uh, there are people. I believe that you can change people if you talk to them. But there are. Does it, if I sat down with the biggest anti-Muslim bigot in America and have a conversation, I'm not gonna change them. We're not gonna leave that conversation. They're gonna be like, you know what, I, I was wrong about Muslims. They seem like good people. The same way some white supremacists, they could sit with Barack Obama, an unbelievably accomplished man, and they could still not believe anything he says or still believe somehow they're superior to them because of their skin color. There's certain people you're not gonna change. That's, it's finding out, and I think the hardest thing is determining who you can change and who you really have to turn your back or even marginalize from mainstream society as a, as a community. Our nation has to do that. Um, and that's the hardest thing. It's a really hard thing. When, they, when they're exposed to it and they still won't change, it's heartbreaking. And that's, that's the definition of bigotry, frankly. You know, this closed-mindedness that won't change in a prejudiced way. But well, one positive thing, uh, and this not along what you were t talking about, but one of the best experiences professionally was when I was on FoxNewsLive.com, I mean, I was on Fox and Friends several times. In fact, one time, all prime time, 6.20 on Saturday morning. <laughs> Although they do have a lot of viewers. And one morning, I remember, I'm waiting to go up the elevator there, and uh, there's another guy standing there waiting to go up. He's on the show, and he reaches over. This was in 2012, and he shakes his hand and goes, Hi, I'm Scott Blakeman. Hi, Michael Cohen. And it was Michael Cohen, who uh, wow. seemed like a nice, schlubby guy. You know, and just, and he gave me his card, and he was like, you know, Mr. Trump, whatever. But I actually find that a great experience. Uh, I met a lot of, you know, before I ever did Fox, I just assumed also any conservative is wrong. And, and I remember I was on the first time, and this guy David Webb, who, you know, he's a show in Sirius. And he doesn't like me. He's a character. But anyway, he, uh, he did say, and F FDR tried to pack the court. And I just probably visibly got, yeah, you making up thing, you conservative. And I went home. My dad and I said, Dad, can we, can we just no, he, he did try to he pack did, the court. Yeah, so he's famous. So thing is, we do, all of us, we, we live learned, in a bubble. Right. I right. never had to defend why I thought the Iraq war was wrong. Because everybody I knew agreed with me. So the first time I would be on Fox, they, 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 say, they would say, you know, climate change is a hoax. And I'm going, 
you're an idiot, you know, because I didn't, well, then I started reading an article or something, and, and I remember I started during the whole healthcare fight in 2009, and they would say incorrect things, and I didn't study a lot, but it was more than they did. I sort of read an article, and it feels good to actually be able to defend yourself without, so being around people, it's a good thing to be around people you disagree with if you could have a civil thing, and I made some good friends from uh, people there, because the nice thing about it was, we did, we'd go out for a drink afterwards, or we, we hung around, and especially this webcast, you went on for an hour. I think, and Dean does it much more than, a million times more than I do, but I think you'd agree some of these shots on CNN, uh, you don't have, a, it, it's very, it encourages sort of division because you don't get a chance for nuance. It's sort of, I mean, you do better than anybody I know, but uh, like, you know, I would never say, well, yeah, the one thing Obama I didn't agree with. You're never gonna say that because they're, so I think it's the way we receive news. I do think it's not healthy to watch uh, watch when Dean's on, but you can't watch MSNBC all day, you know, and I feel a little kind of betrayed, too, for two years, you know, it's almost like Judy Gold, great comedian, said, you know, every day you watch MSNBC, you thought Trump was be gone by six o'clock, you know, and here it is two years later, and it's, it's not healthy, it's healthy to watch and learn a about the world, and so right. I think that's another way for your own sanity and your sure. blood pressure, too, is, uh, is a great line, but to, to actually seek out news, and sadly, that's why the bigots persist is because they have their own reality now. Years ago, you know, maybe you'd get a newsletter in the mail, but there was no Alex Jones and abominable people like him, and there were no links on Facebook to fake things, so it does complicate things. Uh, By the way, does anybody get Sirius XM radio here? Anyone have Sirius XM? One? Few people? All right, I hope you'll tune in my show, six to nine, five nights a week Eastern time, so it's five to eight your time? Oh, it's a eight. great show, and See, Dean's tonight, one of the I'm not people. there tonight, obviously, but I'll be there tomorrow night doing yeah. my show. Now, he doesn't take off normally, but he did it for all of you, and he, it's obviously very informative, and he uh, has... One, and maybe you may want to be interested in this, because she's local. I was blank on the name of uh, the congressman. Ilhan Omar? Yes. Ilhan Omar. So maybe we can talk about her, but yes. Last question. Last question. Oh, okay. Here it comes. Direct from Omar. So I actually had a question about... So since both of you are from different backgrounds and cultures, so could you please give us some examples of the similarities of your family's background and also if it is possible religion? Sure. Well, so, I mean, in some of the jokes I was saying about certainly our mother's strong personalities and, and, and uh, I'm sure, and that, especially with your Sicilian side, food is always very important. Religion for me personally, uh, you know, like many Jews, I mean, I, I was, went to Hebrew school uh, after regular school and that was where I, that was a Hebrew school class clown. That was really where I got my training. I remember the only word uh, that I remember in Hebrew is Anira uh, Tzel Atzeit, I want to leave the room. That, that was the thing. And, and I, after very quickly, I remember him at the turning point when I knew I wanted to be a comedian. I was probably 12. And maybe, I don't know if he was a local or national, but there was a character. I don't know if it was on Soupy Sales, or one kid's show. Um, yeah, it was Soupy Sales, Philo Kvetch. I don't know if you remember the great Soupy Sales. I, he was local, but he also was national too. Anyway. Uh, there was a character in Jewish history called Philo, and the teacher said that. And in my mind, and everybody knew the character, I knew if I said with my high-pitched Brooklyn accent, Philo Kvetch, I knew I'd get a big laugh, and the teacher would kick me out. So I thought about it, and I said, Philo Kvetch, kick me out. And that, and that was, I think, I didn't start being a comedian then, but I think that was the, the turning point. But anyway, uh, I've always been very, very, very proud of being Jewish. In fact, I probably, John Stewart even, did he tell you that I'm probably the most Jewish? I think he told me that. The yes, most comedian seriously. he knows. Well, and you know. I always, even in situations where people don't get it, and when I would used to do commercials, I would audition, and invariably I'd work in a Jewish reference, which served me in no way uh, helpful. So that's who I am. That's who my family are. I'm so proud of that. I, I you know, a Hebrew school, I was bar mitzvah, and, and uh, I go to high holiday services, and I, you know, but, but again, it's my deep connection of being Jewish to me, it's about compassion because look what the Jewish people went through. So we should be extra compassionate to all immigrants, to minorities, and to Palestinians. And it's not a it's not a proper situation. It's not the status quo is not helping anyone. And as so, I feel that you know I don't recognize some of these people as as Jews even because they you have to be compassionate. You, and I always say that you know and you know it's not. Pro-Israel, it's pointless there. You pro-Israel, you pro-Palestinian. The only way to have peace in the Middle East is to be pro-peace. And that helps both sides, and that's how we're gonna get to peace. So that's where I stand. And, and I would just say that 
in America, I've never felt a time where Jews and Muslims have more in common than right now. I've never been involved in more interfaith. I'm involved in this group called MJAC, which is sponsored by ISNA, the big Muslim group, and the AJC. And another Muslim, another Muslim Jewish interfaith group I'm involved in, that we are both minority faiths in this country. And I think that many people who are Jewish became more keenly aware of that in the last two years, as we've seen a spike in anti-Semitism, in, in hate crimes, attacks, the horrific terrorist attack in the Tree of Life Synagogue. And Muslims, we've known we've been a, a, a minority for years. We've seen an uptick. Just two days ago, uh, a mosque in California uh, was set on fire by a guy who sprayed words that were supportive of the, the terrorists in New Zealand. And so this is the world we both live in. We live in a world where we actually have to fear things because of our faith. So I think that's brought us together. You know, religiously, theologically, Muslims, Jews, and Christians were all three Abrahamic faiths. We have, the, the faiths are intertwined. And I mean, I have a cousin named Musa, after Moses, and he's Muslim. You know, I have a, a cousin named Miriam, named after the Virgin Mary, because in honoring the Virgin Mary, who's the woman most celebrated in the Quran, um, to cousin, you know, I know Muslim named Isa for Jesus. So our faiths are intertwined. Unfortunately, in our media, too many extreme voices want to talk about what divides us or separates us and put us at odds. There's no theological reason we don't, we're not brothers and sisters. There's no reason we're not. We should be. We are. Um, I think in the time of Trump, frankly, there's been this bond. Communities have come together a lot more, and I hope that continues going forward. Just today in New York, a mosque sadly had a fire. It wasn't a, a, an act of arson, and the central synagogue, New York, came together and housed them. And as you know, many, the reverse has happened so many times where Muslim communities have reached out to Jewish communities. So that's the natural way. That goes on every day here in America, and that's the natural way. And, we're, and, and you know, so that, that's the example to be set. And, and we are positive, and we should all be positive, too. And, uh, and really, just for both of us, this is such a great experience coming here. Thanks. And, and uh, we'll always remember Duluth. And, uh, and we'll be back, and, inshallah. That's true, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Here's the Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a, a little reception. We have a little reception in the foyer. Um, I can't promise you kosher celery, <laughs> but maybe it's Catholic reception. Anyway, thank you all for coming, and uh, see you at the talk back next week.